Our next speaker, Brother Michael Hatcher, has been, I think, about on this lectureship since it started, just about the second one up to present. Uh, he's a native of Pensacola, born there, 1952. And uh, he there works with the Bellevue Congregation. He's married to the former Karen S. Savage of Trenton, Texas. They have two sons, both are Christian. William Andrew and Daniel Michael. He's a graduate of Harding College back in 76 with a Bachelor of Arts in Bible. He's preached at a number of places in Arkansas and Texas and Oklahoma. And as I said, presently at the Bellevue Congregation. He's the editor of Defender, a monthly paper. And he's been editor of it since 1994. He's a director and editor of the annual Bellevue Lectureship, 1995. I'll say a little more about that when we get up here, as well as the editor of their beacon. He's done a great many different works. We appreciate him for his faithful work, and he's a dear friend, as we do so many who are involved with us here. And we want to have him come and speak to us now on the second incarnation, a book by Rubel Shelley and Randall Harris. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to once again be here. It's always a great joy to come and be with the good brethren here. Appreciate the elders, and of course, David is a good friend. Uh, he and Jody keep me in uh, while I'm here. And then we turn around during our lectures, and we keep David, at, well, Karen and I do, so. We have become good friends through the years and appreciate him for his work's sake. <clears throat> appreciate the lectureship uh, here, the good work that has been done through the years and the good work that's being done this year in exposing these writings. Someone said in one of the lectures that these could, have, could go on for many years with all of the books out there, but really at this time, many of the books are just regurgitating what has been spewed out by the former books. And so it's saying the same things in different words. I said I could uh, mention the Bellevue lectures, uh, the lectures this coming up in June going to be moral issues we face. Uh, we would certainly invite everyone to come and attend, be with us during that period of time. Uh, you'll hear some good gospel sermons by some, some of the speakers that are on this lectureship. And it is a theme that is always pertinent because of all of the immorality that we face within our society. And I'm going to take the opportunity to mention last year's book. We are going to plan on keeping those books in stock, so and it, hopefully we can keep it at a very low price, $3, but it, the intent is not to take it and put it on your bookshelf, uh, read it, give it to someone else. It is intended for those who are outside the body of Christ. Now, it's good for those who are members of the church, and especially, as uh, someone used to say, never underestimate the ignorance of your audience. Well, some of our brethren need some very basic teaching, and so it's good for some of them as well, but it is intended for uh, evangelistic work, to take it, hand it to someone, and through their reading that can be taught the truth. So you can buy a whole bunch of those and hand them out. Let's be among doing that evangelistic aspect of the work of the church, even as we are to defend the, the faith and contend for the faith which was once for all delivered unto the saints. The two authors that, in the book that they wrote, The Second Incarnation, Rubel Shelley and Randall Harris, 
have sat at the feet of liberal theologians and their learning has made them mad. They think they know a great deal. They are PhDs and uh, they have sat at the feet of these liberal theologians and it certainly shows. They know more of liberal theologians than they do of faithful gospel preachers and of God's word. But as so many of these individuals, they must reject pattern theology. There is an emphasis throughout the book of a rejection of pattern theology. Page 31, we reject a rigid pattern theology. Page 36, they talk about scripture certainly does not present an absolute blueprint for building a church. But it's interesting. They cannot avoid pattern theology. They write on page 66, there are surely some patterns and steps and structures to be discerned in scripture. But none of these, nor all of the, them taken together, constitute the church. Well, surprise, surprise, I never knew anyone who thought that the pattern constituted the church, but that the church has to follow the pattern to be the church. I don't know why that's so difficult, but it seems to be, to, at least to some individuals. They write on page 34 in the ecclesiology to be presented in this volume. There is a form of patternism present. So they reject it, yet they present it. I wish they would make up their mind. But in reality, what they want as a pattern is very simply a pattern that changes. That's what they want. Changes with the time, the place, who it is. And if there is a pattern of the Bible, a biblical pattern, then their whole system fails. It's worthless. In the chapter, Worship, the church relates to God. They say on page 128, against the danger of being misunderstood by calling Isaiah 6 a paradigm for God-directed worship. We do not mean to imply there is a rigid pattern. I will admit that they have some good comments in relationship to worship and our attitude in worship. But then they go and destroy everything that they say in regards to our attitudes of worship by everything else that they say. They want this pattern that they are setting forth to change with the times and individuals. They want to have a paradigm that allows for the, their view of grace to override any rules. For example, on page 65, they write, we have proposed a shift from institution to person pattern to principle, deed to motivation. It is an affirmation of grace over our tendency to find and bind rules. It is an affirmation of freedom under Christ's headship over bondage to an imagined prototype or blueprint for the church. Quote. Thus their pattern and their desire for freedom from any prototype or blueprint, they end up with absolutely no rules whatsoever. They can do, or a person can do whatever they want to, and it's going to be all right with God. Of course, God didn't seem to think that way. Genesis 4th chapter when he rejected Cain's offering. 
Why didn't Cain, here he was trying to praise God. Why didn't God give him an affirmation of grace? Doesn't God realize that there's no rules that are to be bound? Our poor Nadab and Abihu. It seems that God had a tendency to bind or to find and bind rules in regards to Nadab and Abihu instead of giving them an affirmation of grace. Noah is one who did, though, find an affirmation of grace. Why? Well, Genesis 6 and verse 22, thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. So did he. That's why in earlier in that chapter that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. To have an affirmation of grace by God, you must obey God's will. There's that rigid, rigid pattern. Noah conformed to that rigid pattern. He received from God an affirmation of grace because of that conforming to a rigid pattern. You could go through the entire Bible in reality and look at the same thing, the same principles being set out. There is a rigid pattern. But according to these authors who are arguing for no pattern at all, and their argument basically is as long as one is showing or giving praise to God, whatever form it might take, and then it's going to be acceptable to God. Their statement is that one, when one comes to an awareness of God, that God is, quote, greater than anything the understanding can approach and too magnificent to explain, he bows low before the, that God and whispers holy. Or he dances before him and shouts holy. Or he weeps before him and cries holy. Or he is too struck with awe to say anything at all. That's on pages 118 and 19. In other words, any way that one wants to express this attitude of awe toward God, then that's fine. It's acceptable to God, and God's going to give him that affirmation of grace because we can't bind any of those rules in a rigid blueprint or pattern. Very simply, that's not the case. I'll, we won't take time. Uh, it's, some of this is in the book that, in which a rigid pattern is set forth within God's word. Again, Cain, you can look at that. You can look at Noah. You can look at Joshua. Uh, and just continue through the, back of the Bible. And when we get to Hebrews, the 8th chapter and verse 5, we see specifically where he goes back into that Old Testament system and he's showing the superiority of the New Testament system. And he says, under that inferior system of the Old Testament, God told Noah, make sure you make all things according to the pattern. Now, if a pattern was important under that inferior system, why would the Hebrew writer even mention it if there's not a pattern to follow under the New Testament system, which is the greater system? But they would have us ignore all this. And when we go to the scriptures, we start finding that that pattern that God has set forth within the pages of the Bible that man does not have the right to change and alter it in any way, shape, or form. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2. Proverbs 30 and verse 6. Matthew 15, verse 3 and verse 9. Those dealing spe specifically with the Old Testament. You can deal with the New Testament as well. Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9. 2 John 9, 3, 11. Or Revelation 22, 18 and 19 and other passages. But what these individuals want is a process of ongoing change. They write in the preface to the book, is there either the need or theological warrant for ongoing change in the church? 
Our answer is affirmative to both the element or to both elements of this question. As they explain still in the preface, uh, the need for ecclesiology, and ecclesiology very simply is the study of the doctrine of the church. They write of the need to be, quote, constantly rethinking what it means to be the church. And the reason of that is, again, quoting, we are enmeshed in an ever-changing world. Doctrine works between the two poles of faithfulness to scripture and relevance to the present age. The task of being the church for our age must be rethought continually. And they put our age in, in, to emphasize it, in emphasis. It's all about our age. Their argument is the world's changing, and it is, at an alarming rate. Since the world changes, though, the church must change. And they will agree, yes, God is unchangeable. The Bible is even unchangeable. But when you get to the church, the church must change. It's not an option. You have to. They write on page 7. Unlike our perfect God or his inscripturated word, the church is not immutable. It has no once for all com complexion. On the page 6, they write, after informing us that uh, dealing with the church, that in the church and all of its instantations, the church has been and is flawed. And then they go on. It is not a fixed, static institution. It has no once-for-all form. The church always has been and is flawed. Now, you start seeing their denigration and their attitude toward the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's flawed. But being flawed thus, there is no, as they talk about, quote, historical prototype, end quote, for man to look back on in regards to the church. They write on page six again. For the corporate body of Christ, there is no historical prototype of the church for duplication. In all of its instantations, the church has been and is flawed. It is not a fixed static institution. It has no once for all form. So, if you want to reproduce the church, you can't do it. There's nothing there to reproduce except something that's flawed. And so if you try to reproduce the church today, you try to reproduce the first century church today, all you're going to end up with is something that's flawed. With uh, what they say is a very real and quite believable dialogue that they set forth, really it's rather absurd. They write on page 20, if the church today should be like the one we read about in the New Testament, do you mean we should have open fornication and abuses of the Lord's Supper like in Corinth? But do you realize, and they don't seem to understand this, that the open fornication... <laughs> And the changes that are made to the Lord's Supper in Corinth, under their system of theology, there's nothing wrong with either one of them. Why? Because there is no rigid pattern. Everything must change. The church must change. And so, there's those 1,000 priestesses at, at Corinth called prostitutes. 
change Aphrodite to Jehovah God and if those cult prostitutes now want to worship God by committing prostitution who's to say that's wrong the church has to change there is no pattern that's why why is it wrong they're just worshiping God uh, the way that they want to worship him. They want to praise God by the committing of fornication and prostitution. It's right. If you want to put coke and steak on the Lord's Supper, then that's fine. Because it has to be culturally relevant. And if it's not culturally relevant for it to be the fruit of the vine and unleavened bread, then let's change it to coke and Whatever. There must be a pattern in order for these to be abuses. And they can't seem to realize that. It's no wonder that toward the end of the book on page 241, that they write, thus we have the right to reconsider our identity under the Pauline metaphor of the church as the body of Christ and trace out some of the implications it has for us. Worship, life, mission, and evangelism all take on new appearances. It sure does. They're right about that. It will take on new appearances of whatever you want to do. The floodgates literally are opened under, well, I'm just praising God by doing this. There is also in this a rejection of the church and the kingdom being the same organization. Many passages could be called upon to show the same, that the church and the kingdom have reference to the same institution. Uh, Matthew 16, 18 and 19, Colossians 1, 13 and others. But they hold that they're not the same. They write on page 75, thus we affirm that the church and the kingdom of God have a con conspicuous and important relationship to one another but they are not one and the same thing. On page 76, they were, in writing of the church, they state that it is an assembly called together by God for what purpose? To pursue the kingdom. The church is not the kingdom. The church is to pursue the kingdom. Again, on page 101, Christ Christ's church is a reality. Oh, it's not a fully established kingdom yet. It is still in the process of forming. Well, you can form it any way you want to, if according to them and the principles of this book. On page 76 and 77, they write, if the church were to claim to be the complete realization of the kingdom, its claim would be idolatrous. And they go on to say, and appear hypocritical. So if you claim that the church of our Lord is the kingdom of our Lord, then that's idolatry. I guess y'all didn't know that. I guess we've been practicing idolatry all these years. You didn't realize it. <coughs> In defining the church, they define the church as a pilgrim church. And they write on page 71, that the nature of the church is that of a pilgrim. The pilgrim church is never a static accomplishment, but always a moving process. I think it's interesting that to show the relationship between the pilgrim church and the kingdom, they quote a liberal Swiss Catholic priest by the name of Hans Kung and his definition of the kingdom of God. In fact, in the manuscript I mentioned in looking at all of the end notes and footnotes, and it is 
there's footnotes all through it. There's only one that I recognize that was a quote from a member of the church, and that was Alexander Campbell, and it really was more a quote to say, we need to be living the type of lifestyle before we try and go out and convert others. But to find out what the church is, we have to go to a liberal Swiss Catholic priest. That shows you a little bit of their attitude toward the Lord's church. <laughs> that they have no respect for God and his word. They certainly have no respect for our brethren. In years gone by or today, what they have respect for, and what they bow to is liberal denominational law. But notice some implications in viewing the church as a pilgrim church. Page 76, first, the church's nature is best understood as a movement toward ideal, not the full embodiment of that ideal. And they write that concerning this idea of a golden age of the church, that there really is no golden age of the church that the church of the New Testament correspond, or that there's never been a time in which the golden or the church of the New Testament corresponds perfectly to God's ideal, page 77. I thought it was interesting on page 80, they write that the pilgrim church approach recognizes that the task of becoming the people of God is never fully accomplished. Hmm. Becoming the people of God is never fully accomplished. Peter didn't seem to know that, did he, when he wrote 1 Peter 2, verse 9 and verse 10? When he says that they, those people that he was writing to, Christians of that time, were a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That is a people belonging to God. To show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Which in times past were not a people but now are the well they, Peter must have made a mistake because he said they are the people of God. That they had not obtained mercy but now they had, have obtained mercy. But according to our authors of this book, this approach to the church, pilgrim approach, the task of becoming the children of God is never fully accomplished. And if you look at Hebrews 4 and verse 9, Hebrews writer says that there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Who's going to receive that rest? It's the people of God. But if process of becoming a people of God is never fully accomplished, then no one's ever going to receive God's rest. We are all hopelessly lost. Taking this approach of a pilgrim church. Taking this approach to, to of the pilgrim church also leads to a different approach to church unity. That's what they state on page 80. The notion of the Pilgrim Church also leads to a different approach to church unity, end quote. That approach, though, is very basically ecumenism. They present a, two graphics to set forth two approaches. The first is the word them with an arrow pointing over to the word us. Now, that's a bad approach. The second graphic that is supposedly the proper approach is that there's a cross between these two words, us and them, and an arrow points from both of them to the cross. Both us to the cross, them to the cross. Thus, there's no real difference between us and them except our religious heritage. They write on page 81, is it possible that we all need to spend a little time calling our own religious heritages back to Jesus Christ? 
If the church is a pilgrim church, this task must be reevaluated in every new generation. Just maybe if each religious tradition would spend one generation trying to do nothing but to be more Jesus like a more Jesus like body, a generation from now in a religious dialogue might take on a new tone. In other words, there's no reason to call anyone out of the Baptist church or the Methodist church or the Catholic church or well, what about if uh, we want to throw Muslims in there? Muslims do believe that Jesus Christ was a prophet, so, you know, we can throw Muslims in there as well. Now, their understanding of Christ, I realize, is totally wrong, but they do believe Jesus was a prophet, so let's throw them in there as well. And the Muslims can point toward Jesus, and we can all just have fun together. The only differences between them is religious heritage, not God's word. But in reality, there is one body, Ephesians 4 and verse 4, and every religious heritage is set in opposition to that one body of the church. And yes, even those who claim to be have the religious heritage of Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone in them. Because that's not our religious heritage. The Bible is what we follow. Not the heritage of some man. Participation in the kingdom, they write, is the theological foundation for all the church's activity thus. Page 82. And the church is unable to bring the kingdom to consummation. Again, page 82. And what they mean by that is that when one looks at the utopian passages of the Old Testament prophets that depict the reign of God, we begin to see how insignificant any human effort would be to bring it about. Page 82. And they will admit again on page 82 that this is a work that only God can accomplish. I would say God has already accomplished it. He accomplished it in Acts the second chapter. When the gospel of Jesus Christ was proclaimed in its purity and those individuals who obeyed that gospel of Jesus Christ, they were taken by God and added to the kingdom. And they were translated into that kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. God did accomplish it. When he took Jesus Christ and raised him from the dead, and he now sits at the right hand of the throne of God, Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, and Matthew 28 and verse 18, thus he has all authority in heaven and in earth. But there are some now practical applications of this, and there's many of these that are in the book. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them. But basically, since they reject a rigid pattern when it comes to our worship, they write the tired, uninspiring event called worship in our churches must give away, give way to an exhilarating experience of God that stimulates or simultaneously exhibits and nurtures life in the worshipers. Page thirteen. Now they omit how this exhilarating experience is going to be achieved each week. Plus, they do have a problem. What one, cons one individual might consider an exhilarating experience might not be an exhilarating experience to someone else. For example, when the Dallas Cowboys score a touchdown and they beat an opponent, that's an exhilarating experience. Thank you. <laughs> but someone else... It might not be too exhilarating. They might be rather disappointed in that. Now, I can't understand why. They need to get a better understanding. But don't you see? Each individual, that exhilarating experience is different. Now, how are they going to account for that? They can't. That's their problem. But... The only sure thing, according to them, is that our worship must change. 
verse 130 or page 135 they write corporate worship of this sort is a form of collective wonder and awe before God that is expressed in culturally relevant ways so whatever is culturally relevant to you that's that exhilarating experience they go on to write uh, still on page 135 that when the spirit of God is present it will not always be possible to determine the atmosphere in advance Leaders may intend and prepare for a service of one sort, and God may bring about another end to his glory. Now notice what's happened. This exhilarating experience that they're writing about is going to be accomplished by God. But what if we have a, to them, a tired and uninspiring worship? Then whose fault is it? If God's the one who's going to bring about this exhilarating experience and you don't have that exhilarating experience, it's God's fault. Man can't do it. God did not do what was necessary to make an exhilarating experience. But in reality, they want to do away with any solemnity and dignity in our worship to God. That's out. It just has to be exciting. In regards to the church's work, well, we should realize that the work of the church is that of saving souls, carried out by the preaching of the gospel, by edifying the saved, and by those areas of benevolence. But our authors of this book have a far different view. And it is, in reality, the epitome of the social gospel. You want the go social gospel, you just look at what they write. And we won't have time to really go into it, to a lot of this. But as they write concerning the mission of the church as it relates to the world, they write and say, we submit that there are three aspects to the church's mission of modeling transcendence, even in the mundane. Those three aspects are demonstration, holiness and justice, and a prophetic aspect. And then when they're speaking of the demonstration, they write that the first aspect of the church's relation to the world is loving, nurturing service with no strings attached. It's not spiritual in the least. It's all social oriented. Well, when they get to evangelism, they don't want to evangelize in the, thing, in the way in which we think. Their view is a denominational encounter with Jesus. On page 181, the responsibility of the Christian community to bear witness to the saving work of Christ in, of God in Christ. And they write then on page 182 that our total contribution to the salvation task is to make possible an event, an event of encounter between Jesus and lost people. It's an encounter with Jesus. We never talk about obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ as set forth in the Bible. And plus, you don't have to worry about these denominational folks because they, all they need to do is stay there and point back to Jesus and they'll be fine. These men left the moorings of God's word long ago and the Lord's church. They are denominational in their thinking. They need to be honest enough to leave the Lord's church and to join with the denominations that they love. Sadly, they won't do that. They want to take as many people to hell with them as they possibly can. And we need to stand up against such nonsense as what they write in the second incarnation thing. Very good job, and we do appreciate that good lesson, Brother Mike. I was thinking concerning the, the culture of the church, and you really can't find it. It's sort of a nebulous thing. Well, the brethren here, and I'm sure some of you preachers have done the same thing. Uh, it's a strange thing to me if there's no form to the church, if there are no identifying marks of the church, how do the enemies of the church find it to persecute it? They seem to know who they're after. 
and they know who believes what that they consider to be people we ought to get after. <laughs> Brother G.K. Wallace said a long time ago with the old Free Harden Lectures, he said, the modernist gets up here and says, I can't take the Bible and get after anybody with it. But they don't mind taking the Bible and trying to get after me with it. And that's basically what these fellows are saying. Uh, if you read in the New Testament about Christian living, then you're going to be reading about uh, the spiritual culture of the Lord's church. What does it take to make up a culture? What does it take to make up a certain society? Well, they have to believe and act and think and move in a certain way. Well, does the will of Christ, the head of the church, direct the church, the members in particular, how to believe and live and act? Does he tell us where to set our minds and how to do? And, and does he tell us certain things that uh, we shouldn't do? Let me just very quickly note, and this is only just one place, uh, you could start in chapter 4, really, or chapter 5. Well, so many places you could start. Uh, but listen to this if you want to see a culture, a way of life, a way of thinking. Listen to what Paul says we have in Ephesians 5. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not once be named among you as becoming saints. Sounds like he's describing a way of life, conduct, something that would make a culture. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance of the kingdom of Christ and of God. Well, there's a culture that certainly doesn't describe faithful members of the church. Let no man deceive you with vain words, words to no point, words to no value. I suggest that describes most of these books and most of what's in these books that we're dealing with here. He said, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God, now listen, upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Don't get in their culture. Don't live like they live. Don't think like they think. Don't associate like they do. Here's why. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light of the Lord. Walk as children of light. Is that a certain way to live, a certain way to think? certain way to associate, and then in parenthetical expression, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And we are to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. And you could go on, and, and you're seeing then there is a form to God's people in what they believe and in what they practice. Thus, there are identifying marks that are found in the New Testament where you can find the church. And thus people who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness and follow the teachings of the Christ, they're going to be able to find the truth, which every man must find, believe, and obey. And then they're all going to be in the same culture. Because the Lord will add you to that church that has that culture. And then you live in harmony with the will of Christ that promotes and keeps that culture. And watch, keeps you separate from any other culture, any other way of conduct, any other way of thinking, and makes you then that purchased people of people for God's own possession. So when these fellows walk up these vain words and start this stuff, they're just a bunch of mouthy. That's all it is. If you're anchored in the knowledge of the word of God, right and divided, then these things simply are things to be rejected and to keep moving on as we ought to be.